yet. Not yet, Thaddeus. Just keep cool. Move slowly. Just two guys heading home, not doing anything wrong. I, I, I know we didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything wrong either. Keep cool, will ya? Be thankful we're not Peter or John. Nobody knows who we are. Then why do I think everyone who looks our way recognizes us? That's just old-fashioned paranoia. Uh, what are they going to do to him? I don't know, but it wasn't good, and it wasn't legal. It won't? You don't grab someone after dark if it's legal. Whatever they're doing, only God can save him now. But he is God, and, and he's the Christ. Why did they let him take him away? If I knew that, I wouldn't be scared out of my wits right now. It was so terrifying. We were all half asleep when a, a whole squad of soldiers and men with torches came barging into the garden. I thought we were all dead. And Judas went with them. Judas led them there and handed Jesus over to them. With a kiss, the filthy traitor. Jesus knew Judas was going to betray him. He sent him out to do it. After dinner, you heard him say he knew it. We all heard it. If only we knew what he meant at the time. Maybe we could have stopped him. Or maybe not. What do you mean? If Jesus wasn't at all surprised when they came for him, it's like he was waiting for them. And then, when Peter drew his sword and cut the man's ear off, Jesus rebuked him and healed the man's ear. I didn't catch that part. I was running already. I, I really, he really healed the man? Now that I think about it, it's not the first time Jesus and Peter have butted heads like that. I remember. Tonight, over dinner, Peter told him he'd never, ever run away. He followed him to the death. And Jesus said, and Jesus said he'd deny him three times before the rooster crowed. Do you remember the day Jesus asked us who we thought he was? Peter told him, you are the Christ. Then Jesus began saying strange things like he was going to be taken away and put to death. Peter tried to tell him, Jesus, he was wrong. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. I forgot all about that. You think Jesus knew this was coming even way back then? I think he's always known. I think he tried to repair us for it all along. But he's the Messiah. He's our deliverer. The one who came to save us. How can he do that if he's dead? He's not dead yet, Thaddeus. No, but from the looks of things, it won't be long. John fifteen thirteen, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Have you ever found yourself watching an action movie where the hero has a wise, kind, old mentor? He's always there for the hero, always teaching, guiding, helping when it's needed. And then, and he's the kind of teacher you'd really like to have, like the sidekick character. You fall in love with him. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he gets killed. The mean, nasty filmmaker spent the whole time making you love this character. And without warning, he's gone from the movie. It's a pretty common theme that shows up in a lot of movies. Sometimes it's a wise mentor who dies, sometimes it's a star-crossed lover, sometimes it's a really funny, clever sidekick. We never want to see anything bad happen to our favorite characters, but sometimes in the midst of a great adventure story, a sacrifice is made. One friend lays his life down so that the hero can win the day. Kind of like our theme verse. And it's in John chapter 15, it's verse 13, and it says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. We're continuing our series on jelly beans. Last week, a white jelly bean was a reminder of Jesus' life, unselfish life given in service to the poor, the sick, the lowly. Well, this week we move on to the red jelly bean. And if you haven't guessed, that red re color reminds us of Jesus' blood. It's no surprise to any of us what happened to Jesus on Good Friday. The crosses on our churches, around our necks, many people in the church are a reminder of the horrible death that Jesus died. But leading up to that fateful weekend, no one, especially the disciples, could have imagined that Jesus was going to die. Jesus had predicted his death more than once. And his disciples were sometimes confused by what Jesus was trying to tell them. Other times they argued with Jesus because they didn't want to believe that he was going to die. Peter famously tried to tell Jesus that he was wrong. 
whole man, and he got a stern rebuke for his argument. Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23 tell us that. And it says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter wasn't trying to prevent Jesus from fulfilling his purpose. He simply couldn't bear the idea of seeing his hero die. If Jesus was the Messiah, then he had come to save Israel. He couldn't do that if he was dead, now could he? Well, the day finally came when Jesus would be handed over to be put to death. It was late at night. The disciples had shared their last supper with their master. Jesus had sent Judas, one of the twelve, out to fetch the men who were going to arrest him and put him on trial. No one else in the room knew what Judas would do, but Jesus knew it had to be done. Later that night, Jesus was praying in a garden. The disciples were all there with him, but they were sleeping. Jesus prayed over and over asking God if there was another way that he could fulfill his mission. But finally, Judas arrived and the men from the temple with the men from the temple, and Jesus was taken away. John chapter 18, verses 1 through 14 tell us that account. And it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he sent out, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and the disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, was um, also new with the place, for Jesus often had met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Ju Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fill the, fill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father of father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. What an astonishing scene. The disciples knew the religious leaders were out to get Jesus. They knew that an angry mob in the middle of the night spelled big trouble for Jesus. Suddenly, the unthinkable became very real. Jesus was being arrested, and most likely, he was going to be put to death. Well, once again, Peter stepped in, <laughs> and he pulled out his sword, and he drew blood, striking one of the men and cutting off his ear. But once again, Jesus rebukes Peter. Jesus healed the man, and then he left with the mob. It's a little like seeing your favorite movie character meet his doom. Only this isn't a movie character. This was the Messiah, the man who had 12 friends and was able to convince um, hundreds more that he had come to save Israel. How can he save Israel if he's dead? Well, here's what the disciples didn't understand. Jesus hadn't had come to not just save us from, um, from Rome, but he had come to save them from their worst enemy yet. He had come to save them from sin and us too from our sin. The entire Bible is the story of God's plan to save mankind from sin. When sin entered the world in the book of Genesis, God became separated with his creation, his favorite creation, us, people, men, women, children. Uh, the Bible tells us that punishment for sin is death, eternal separation from God. And for centuries, the people uh, would have to make blood sacrifices to atone for their sins, sacrificing goats and lambs on an altar. But only the blood of one perfect person 
could wipe away the sins of the whole world and reunite God with his creation. So that's why God sent his son, who was both God and man, to die on a cross. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, the final sacrifice, and his death paid the price for our sins once and for all. So the red jelly bean is a reminder of the blood that Jesus shed for us. And without that blood, we would not be here celebrating our salvation and the forgiveness of sins. We would still be waiting for God to make a way for us to be reunited to him. Because Jesus died, we can know him as our savior. We can have our sins forgiven and we can have eternal life.